Hey guys, this is Safe Dork here. Um, you guys have asked for it. I've got it. This is the GPD Pocket by Gamepad Digital, and I'm going to do a video teardown. Um, now, there's a lot of things about this. You can read all sorts of kind of reviews. It's a very small, very exciting device. I'm not going to get into how fast it is, is it going to run Skyrim, anything like that. You can find that elsewhere. I'm more interested in what's in it. Uh, how good it is, and I kind of want to go over some of the engineering decisions that they've made on it. Um, so the first thing you want to do is make sure that it's off. Um, we will be unplugging the battery, which will definitely turn it off, but it's a good idea to sort of shut it down properly beforehand to make sure your windows doesn't get messed up. Um, so turn it off and close it. I'm really a huge fan of the magnesium case on this. This is uh, really, really quite nice. Uh, so the back is held on by six screws. The uh, bottom case appears to have been stamped, and there's something kind of interesting about it. Actually, after the stamping, they had to machine it to get some clearance for some of the parts inside it. So uh, definitely that was a decision that was made after the stamping was created, because uh, there's, there's no way they would have done that otherwise. Um, so I was kind of uh, interested to see how quickly they were able to get this product to market, you know, even from having that prototype. And um, it, it does it does kind of show there are a lot of choices they made that um, were not not bad, but um, a little bit quicker. So we'll flip this over and have a look about what I was talking about. So you can see that here. There's a big long slot and two little notches that are machined into the bottom of this. Um, the slot here uh, matches up with the fan. It clears the edge of the fan. Uh, and these two notches, one matches up with the heatsink for whatever reason, and the other one, the heatsink kind of rises up a bit and matches up with that. Um, so I'm going to go over sort of the different parts on this and uh, mention their part numbers and data sheets and, and sort of go over it. So the first thing you're going to want to do is unplug the battery. And I think this is just really sad, like the battery connector they used on this. This is probably one of the worst connectors they could have used because the amount of force it requires to unseat the connector is quite low. Um, really, there are any number of better connectors they could have used, especially with this custom um, flat uh, flex PCB cable. but. Uh, what, what are you going to do, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, they've um, secured the battery connector on there with a small bit of foam to sort of keep it in place by resting it against the bottom case. Um, there have been several um, reports of this not being sufficient. Um, I'm really not that surprised given how terrible it is. Uh, but what can you do? Um, if you're having problems with the device not turning on or problems with the battery, you can probably fix it by reseating this and perhaps taping it down with some capped on tape. Uh, so we got the heat sink here. The heat sink is decent. Uh, there's really nothing wrong with it. After I pull it off, you'll see, however, that it does not make very good contact with the CPU, as evidenced by the fact that there is so much thermal paste left on here. Um, and that's just, it's really sad. One thing you can do to sort of alleviate it is to bend these legs upwards to push the center point downwards and have a little bit more clamping pressure on the CPU. Um, another thing you can do that will definitely be better is to add a copper shim on the bottom. Some people have recommended putting a um, two millimeter thick uh, thermal pad on the bottom of this to get it to contact the bottom case here. Um, and what that will do is uh, make it um, so it's a little bit more um, heat on the bottom, but it's uh, less um, heat through the processor. So up to you on that. Um, this is a very common mod. I'm sure there'll be more info elsewhere. Uh, this is a fairly standard Wi-Fi. Um, when I received these, these connectors were pretty much at the very end of their um, run, uh, and they were coming off at the steepest angle they could. I uh, sort of move them forward a little bit in these um, little Wi-Fi cable holders, which are very nice, I might add, uh, and gave it a little bit better angle on that. Um, I don't think it'll fix your Wi-Fi woes, but 
it made me happier and it's a bit easier to plug them in. Um, next we're going to pull off the display cable. This is most likely EDP embedded display port although it could be LVDS. Uh, behind it we can see this cable which connects the power sa or the power button and the two little indicator LEDs to the motherboard. You can see two very small transistors here uh, and some resistors. Those are going to set the brightness and turn those LEDs on and off. Um, and what you'll see here is that they've used the same connector for the power button board, the battery, and the keyboard controller board. Um, but the keyboard controller board and the power button board are slightly bigger, make a more secure connection, whereas the battery board is smaller and does not make a very good connection, um, leading to all the problems that we have. I think this is a big mistake on their part. Um, they could have used a more robust connection, one that makes a more solid connection and doesn't, you know, sort of requires more force to unseat, something like that. The other major qualm I have with it is if we sort of remove this, get it out of our way. The fan connector is terrible. Um, if you get like the name brand one for this connector, uh, it's not bad. But the off-brand low quality ones, it's very hard to get these unseated uh, without damaging the connector because of how thin it is on the top. Um, you can do it, but I'm not going to because it's very finicky and I don't want to break it while I'm doing a live teardown. Um, so I'm going to take the screws out and then we'll go over everything that's going on on the top of this PCB. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find all the information I wanted about all the chips on here, uh, but for everything I, I could find, I, I grabbed a data sheet. Uh, all right. So the first thing is we're going to go and pull up my album here because I am very lazy and like to follow notes I've already made. Uh, so the first thing here is this chip right here. This is labeled a, well, the labeling is a bit different from the part number often, uh, but this is labeled, or this is a, um, let me pull it up, this is a PI3 USB 30532. Um, Paracom makes this, I think uh, TI makes it as well. Um, this is basically a MUX, DMUX, or a switch that switches between Display port and USB 3, uh, basically this powers the Type-C port and switches video or USB out on it. Uh, one interesting fact is this is, as far as I can tell, the exact same chip that's used on the Nintendo Switch. It's got the same part number and I should make a post on their forums because they said, what is this? We don't know what chip this is. Well, I know what it is and uh, maybe I could enlighten them. Um, Anyway, um, it's actually kind of an expensive chip. I don't know if they could have got away with a cheaper one, um, but this is uh, uh, definitely kind of nice. Um, after that, we'll look at the RAM. The RAM is Elpida, now Micron, uh, which might say how old it is because Micron absorbed Elpida a couple of years ago. Um, this is, um, the part number for this is an EDFA232A2MA-GD. Um, Micron will not give you data sheet on this unless you're a partner with them. So all I have is a brochure. This is fairly straightforward. This is a 800 megahertz DDR3-1600 LP DDR3 RAM. Um, this is a actually this is part of a 16 gig kit, but this is only half of it. So there's only eight gigs here. Um, and this runs at 1.2 volts. Um, the temperature is negative 30 C to plus 85 C, which is fairly standard for this kind of component. Um, this came out a couple of years ago, but there's really nothing wrong with it. Um, the next thing is the CPU. It's an Intel Atom Z8750 at 1.6 gigahertz. Uh, Intel says this will burst up to, if I can pull it up, IS. It will burst up to 2.56 gigahertz, which is quite fast. Um, two megs cache, two watt SDP, which is the scenario design power. As we all know, these are pretty much 
throttle exclusively by their cooling. Um, if you run Intel burn test over on this, you will see the flops decrease every single time as it gets hotter and throttles more. Uh, but that is the small computer life that we live. Um, interesting fact, this only supports 8 gigs of LP DDR3 1600, so we have the fastest and most amount of RAM that you can run with this processor. Uh, one last thing, I won't go over the graphics card, it's, you can look it up. One last thing, this only has two PCIe lanes on it. Um, so a lot of people were saying, oh, well, you got a Type-C connector, why didn't you go Thunderbolt 3? That's the reason. This doesn't have enough USB, or I'm sorry, does not have enough PCIe lanes to support that. Um, if you look on the data sheet in Intel's ARC, uh, PCI 2.0, it supports 2x1 or 1x2, but there's only two PCIe lanes, uh, which is not sufficient to support a Thunderbolt port and anything else. Um, I suspect that the um, Wi-Fi card is running on the PCIe bus, but I don't know for sure. Um, the last thing, and it's this guy over here, this is labeled in Intel, the part number is PMB6835A. Um, this guy, I, it took me a bit to look it up. Um, I was able to get a pretty good read on what this is. Uh, let me just pull up my data sheet here. Oh, um, interestingly enough, this and the Wi-Fi, which we'll cover later, are both shared with the GPD Win, as well as the processor and the RAM. So there are some shared components, which is another thing that helped them to shorten their design uh, life cycle, although this circuit board is quite different. Uh, and this guy is a PMIC for um, this device. And you can tell because it's surrounded by all these inductors or chokes bunch of capacitors and very fat PCB traces. Uh, basically, this guy, um, I don't know if it's made by Intel because I was only fine Renesis and uh, Rome that make this, uh, but basically this outputs like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 different voltage levels for the CPU and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 different channels for the PCH. Um, and basically this is your voltage controller for everything that matters. Um, the CPU, the PCH, and probably the RAM as well. Um, anyway, there's a lot of really good stuff on this, how they work. Uh, they're very expensive and quite nice. On the GPD Win, this is heat synced. On here it's not. I don't think heat syncing it will get you anything because these guys are probably rated to operate at 125C and they're not going to hit that here because the CPU will thermal throttle before it uh, runs out of uh, current on the voltage controller here. Uh, but this is a PMIC. Um, the last thing here is the Wi-Fi card. Um, I was not able to find very much information on this other than it's shared with the GPD Win. Um, looking it up... Um, Toshiba certified this in December of 2015 for their A10, AT10C tablet PC um, with the Wi-Fi consortium. Um, Ninabot Changzhou in 2017 certified this with FCC uh, for an Android tablet. Um, I don't know very much about the tablet because I actually looked up the PCB for it and it's a different package. The one that Ninabot has is square, it's labeled a bit different, and instead of being what this is presumably be a BGA, it's got pins all down two of the sides. Um, so I, I don't know how much they're related. Um, thanks to DL Ford on Reddit for identifying this. It is inside the chip is um, a Broadcom BCM4356 according to Vendev.org, which I completely forgot about and I'm glad he looked it up for me. Um, so I think that just about does it for the top. I do want to cover the fan. The fan is different from the GPD Win. The GPD Win is a six millimeter fan, which is 25 millimeters square. This is 30 millimeters square and five millimeters thick. Um, uh, running Prime 95, I measured it at 3.9 volts with a multimeter, which means it's probably a five volt, maybe a six volt fan. Um, for just the normal cooling without anything done, it hits ADC on Intel burn test, which is probably when it starts to thermal throttle. 
Um, the fan seems to really start to go on high once the processor hits about 50C. Um, the GPD Win actually used a very nice fan. They used a Sunon magnetic bearing fan, which is uh, quite good. Um, very quiet, very high RPM. I think it's 13,000. This one, I don't know. I actually don't really know how it's mounted even. I think it's either pinned or plastic riveted down to the, um, to the keyboard there. Um, I don't know if replacing this is going to get you anything. I'll look around and see if the good fan manufacturers, uh, Sanyo, um, um, Sunon, um, NMB, Pan and Sonic, uh, those have any fans in this size that are good. I know more about uh, large bagel server fans. This dude is completely nuts and we'll cut your finger off. Um, but we'll have a look at it and, and sort of see what we can find on that. Um, other people recommend putting a gasket between the fan and the heatsink. Um, that will definitely help with efficiency a little bit. Um, and you know, it's all the small things. I'll probably just put a piece of Kapton tape on it. Honestly, I don't think uh, putting like a whole gasket around it is, is gonna make too much of a difference, but putting, a, um, putting some Kapton it will. And you can also put another thermal pad between the uh, heat sink and the bottom case, sort of get as much heat out of the bottom case if you like that sort of thing. If not, I mean, it's, it's going to heat up more, so if you use it on your knee, it's, it's going to be bad. Okay, so moving it over, um, the fan, I'm not going to unplug that because of how fragile it is. Uh, I really hate this connector, but the fan uh, cables are actually quite long. Um, so we can get in under the PCB and flip it over without bothering the fan. It just takes a little bit of doing. It's a lot easier when you don't have a camera in your face. Okay, looking at the back. Flip this over and try not to get thermal paste everywhere. All right. So here we have the back of the PCB. Um, this has sort of a lot more interesting components to me, but we know less about them. Um, so starting, um, we're gonna start with the EMMC. This is a Samsung DJNB4R, model number KLMDGAJENB-BO41. Um, Samsung, like Micron, will not give you data sheets, um, unfortunately, but they just give you a product resource. This is a 128 gig. It came out in 2013. They want it for like smartphones and whatnot. Um, temperature minus 25C to plus 85C, which is fairly standard for this. Um, you know, again, it's it's pretty straightforward. Um, the device here, I actually wasn't able to pull a data sheet for. This is labeled a Winbond 25Q54FW SIG. Um, I think it's related to the 25Q54V instead of W. Um, it's a flash memory. Um, it's a 3 volt, 64 megabit serial flash memory with dual quad SPI and QPI. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is a BIOS. Um, and since it's SPI, you might be able to read the BIOS and disassemble it. Uh, that's definitely beyond my expertise though. Um, it also is really big and has big traces. This is probably cheap, but it does the trick, no worries. Um, the next thing I want to look at is this chip, which I was very surprised to see. This is a Realtek ALC5645 audio card. Um, I don't know why they're using this, because if you look in the device manager, it says it's using the Intel SST for the mic and the speakers, and I believe for the... Um, headphone jack as well. Um, so what this is for at a guess would be audio over the video output, HDMI and the display port on the USB. But I thought those would use the Intel ones as well. So I'm not 100% sure. It does show up in Device Manager, so we might be able to learn more just looking at the software side of things. Um, this is also kind of expensive and um, I'm kind of like unsure why they would include it except to specifically have audio output over the video. Um, so you can look up the data sheet on it. Um, I, I mean, Realtek has like a like a 50 page data sheet with all kinds of info. Um, looking at next, this 
chip I'm very interested about. This is a Texas Instruments BQ24292i 4.5 amp single cell USB battery charger management IC. Um, it's actually a USB adapter charger and supports USB on the go. So this basically is charging the battery from the USB port and discharging the battery into the rest of this. Um, another thing to note is the inductor on this is heat synced to the keyboard. I don't know why. I think there's, it's probably not dissipating that much heat from the inductor, but, uh, but it is. Um, this guy is actually quite nice. This is a high efficiency 4.5 amp switch mode charger. It's 92% efficient at 2 amps, 90% 90% at 4 amps. It doesn't say at 4.5. Um, it supports batteries of, or it supports import voltage of 3.9 to 17 volts, which is quite wide. Um, if you look at the spec page that GPD gave with us, it says the different voltage levels and current it accepts on USB Type C. This is the reason why. Um, this can support, again, 3.9 to 17 volts, and it's, um, it's a buck, it's a buck um, charger because the battery is 3.8 volts. Um, this is designed for one battery. It supports USB on the go. And one thing I'm very interested about is it's actually 1.5 megahertz uh, switching frequency, which is about twice what you'll find in like normal regulators on video cards and motherboards and other devices. Um, so it's going to actually be very... Um, stable because of that. I don't know if they're running it at the full 1.5 megahertz. I'm guessing they are. Um, another thing that's really cool is it's 0.5% charge voltage regulation. Um, that's actually quite good. That's going to make sure that our beautiful battery here does not explode and catch fire. Um, it only has 7% charge current regulation, but that's really not that big of a deal because when the battery's charging in current, limited mode, it's just going to be limited by whatever you set the current at. It's really at the end of the charge cycle where the constant voltage charge happens, that is the most important, and this supports 0.5%. So I'm actually very happy about this. This is not a cheap chip. Um, this is actually quite expensive as far as chips go. Um, and I think it's nice that they've included such, you know, sort of high-end components on this. The circuit board is very nice. It's black. It's thick. It has uh, nicely routed power traces. I'm sure it's a bazillion layers thick. And it has uh, the gold um, sort of plating on everything, which is good. Uh, you'll see this more on the top. I forgot to point it out, but the top has a huge amount of test points. There are a decent amount here around the chips, um, possibly for... SPI programming and all that. Um, this tiny little chip here, which you can't probably see in the video, but you can see in the pictures. This chip here is sitting right next to this um, R010 um, current shunt. Um, I'm guessing this is the current sense IC and it assists this guy. I'll have to read the data sheet to know for sure. I'm not 100% sure what it is. It's labeled plus 17050, and the next line is A2A67AA. Uh, I basically don't know anything about it uh, at all. Uh, I tried looking up, but I couldn't. Uh, here we see three, one, two, three. These are six pin uh, ICs. These are probably the PWM controllers. We see one of the nice chokes here. I believe these are made by Hitachi and quite expensive. We see two more chokes here. Um, these are controlling the uh, voltages for what runs this chip and what runs this chip probably possibly what runs this as well um, and we see a, a collection of uh, MOSFETs there's one here there's one here this is one uh, most of the back seems to be you know power delivery which is you know half of what this is it's literally it's digital circuits these days they're they're chips and power delivery um, there are two very tiny ICs here and here, I don't know what they are or what they do. Um, one of them is labeled HSBF, and the next line is HID. And the other one is labeled 581, next line B3214, next line AQXE. No idea. Um, my guess is they are little helper ICs for the USB Type C to do various things. Um, so that really covers it for the circuit board. Um, it's pretty nice. I do want to go over a couple more things. Um, let me sort of put this back a little bit. 
Uh, first of all, uh, everyone is very excited about this area because it's a big empty space. I haven't measured it, but it's quite large. It's entirely possible you can fit a micro SD card reader here. Not sure if a full size SD card reader will fit, but a micro possibly will. Um, the problem is getting USB off the board. I don't see any obvious unused USB areas. There might be some on some of these test points. I doubt it, um, but there might. What you could do, and this is way over the top, is desolder the USB port, solder those lines to a USB 3 hub, solder lines from the hub back to the USB port, which you'll have to flip over and solder on the back and then glue down. And then on the other end of the USB 3 hub, tap some of the ports off to whatever USB devices you want to put here. That would work. It would be quite an involved mod. So hopefully we won't have to do that, but it would be cool. Uh, the last thing we want to look at is the keyboard PCB. Uh, this has one chip on it, and I don't know very much about it, unfortunately. Um, this is labeled... Oh man, I've even done this twice and I forgot to write it down. Let me look it up. Okay, here we go. Alright, this is labeled SH61F83Q. Um, pulling that up pulls up parts distributors in China. I don't know what it is, um, but I know what it does. This basically converts the keyboard matrix into most likely USB. Uh, we also have a PS2 track point on this. PS2 is very common. The track point, as far as I can tell, is the same one that was used on the HP Elite books uh, for the last couple of years. It's just quite a fine trackpad. And we also have a microphone on the back of this PCB and the speaker. Uh, we see a line of pull-up resistors here, and I really like these Wi-Fi cable clamps that sort of keep the cable in its place. I really like to see that. In fact, you see more down here on the side. We have three more that just keep the Wi-Fi cables sort of situated and routed so they're not flapping around. Uh, the Wi-Fi antennas are probably in the back here, um, sort of MacBook style where they have this plastic piece here and the Wi-Fi escapes out of this because obviously if you have a grounded metal enclosure, Wi-Fi doesn't want to come out of there very well so it's got to come out of here. I don't know if it's possible to upgrade the antennas. Um, you might be able to put a powered antenna somewhere in here but it would have to be right here and then run it off, you know, USB power or something. Um, I'm inclined to say you're stuck with the antennas you have. Uh, one other thing that's interesting, we have very standard hinges. These are hinges that you would find on a normal, uh, very cheap, low-end, 10-inch, possibly 12-inch sort of netbook type computer, you know, $200, whatever. Um, if you notice, it's kind of stiff to open and close, um, and that's because these are torsion hinges where they have a specific resistance to twisting. Um, and they, they keep the, um, the display from flopping down on you. Um, these are just like normal ones for like a, another, you know, device, uh, sort of like a standard kind of part. You can actually order these with a custom like torsional resistance to them. Um, I suspect GPT have not done that here for two reasons. One, the short development life cycle, uh, and two, that would be more expense. You have to MOQ. And three, it's not really necessary. I think having the stiff um, sort of hinge action is, is quite nice. Uh, one last thing, this is the magnet. The Hall effect sensor appears to be on the screen and this appears to be the magnet that sort of um, actuates it. Um, I really like how crisp, I guess this is. And a lot of computers, if you sort of lift up just one side of it, it'll twist. Um, and the magnet's only on one side, but if you lift up just the one side here, it will all open like at the same time. So I really appreciate that about the design. Um, I think that pretty much covers it. Um, this video has gone on. Um, I sort of covered everything I wanted. Uh, again, I'll put the data sheets and information in the description. Uh, I've been posting on Reddit uh, and I've got my Flickr album of all the detailed pictures. Um, so we'll sort of see what we can do with this, what kind of mods we can do, and uh, sort of what went into it. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I really like, you know, sort of taking these things apart and seeing how they work. And uh, I guess we'll leave it at that. 
Uh, so take care now and um, have a good one.